Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading property experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel, and Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investment Professionals of Australia, and the 2014 and 2015 Property Investment Advisor of the Year. All right, folks, you're on the property couch for each week. Ben and I bring you the insider's guide to property investing. Welcome to the couch, mate. Thank you, Bryce. Thank you. But I'm a bit somber. Yeah. Mm. Pies. <laughs> We've got to win seven of our last eight. No chance. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, come on, boys. Just dig deep. Find a way. Believe. Get the chat up out there. Just, you know, get engaged. Mate, you think it's too big. you just got to win our game. <laughs> Turn. We our won game. a few in a row a while back. Just our Come on, game. boys. V- uh, let's talk VFL team. They're going all right. Knocked off Fritz Grey last week. Did you? Yeah. They got, uh, pr- premiers of last year. We were going okay in the twos. Doesn't matter, mate. In if, the you're, twos. if you're in the bottom eight of the ladder, you can still I'm going to Vic Park and watch it. No, no. We, side by side, Bryce. Side by side. Nathan, he deserves another term. You can't be serious. I can't anyway, be serious. Let's get on to serious matters today. <laughs> hey, um, had free go. That's what I said. Let's go on to serious <laughs> matters today. Um, realestate.com.au, Ben. Yes. Video came out this week. The power of compounding. Mm. And I, I believe there was a sneaky sort of beer shot in there. Was there a beer shot in there, Ivers? Mm, was it? Yeah. Mm. Had a terrific first season. It's the last video of season one. Um, so now now I'm doubting myself. You two. Yeah, no, no, no. I watched it. I think it was yeah. in the pub. Yeah, yeah, it was in the pub. It was in the pub. Yeah, yeah the big red couch in the pub. Yep. So uh, a little sneaky. Um, little, how sneaky can we get you, Ben? But season two, we've shot it. Yes. It's currently in the edit suite. It is. About to be launched. And um, let's just say when you view it, um, just say we understand the pain that a swimsuit model goes through (laughs) when she's asked to uh, pretend it's summer when it's actually winter. And we relied on a Melbourne outdoor setting. And a Melbourne outdoor setting. It was fart reezing. Yes, it was cold. And you weren't wearing but like, But like true professionals... We ship it all. It on. We ship it all the way through. We soldier it on. So, but um, yeah, there's a little uh, little thing to see if you notice uh, Ben and I shivering through season two. But gosh, we loved it. We're, there was some powerful nuggets that we're unpacking, Ben. Yep. So uh, if you're not if you're not on our social media, um, now's the time at the Property Couch uh, at Ben Kingsley AU at Bryce Holdaway because we put the little snippets out via our social media. We do. Which means that you can then log on and see the full episode. Yep. Uh, Under the guides or news area of realestate.com. Yeah, so it's a terrific collaboration that we're really excited about doing. So Very good. All right, today, um, Ben. 123, episode 123, what do we got? Uh, our theme today is we- what actually is owner-occupier <laughs> yeah, appeal, Ben? Yeah, we thought we'd... we'd I'm, we're gonna. What are we gonna? Do? We're gonna unpack it. No, we're not. We're gonna give some gold. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna give some nuggets of gold, and we're gonna unpack it. So, so we talked about what scarcity is. Yep. We talked about in certain parts what makes for investment grade. Yeah. But what actually is owner occupier appeal? And it's important because uh, when you're buying an investment property, mm. you're still buying a property that yep. has owner occupier appeal, even though it sounds paradoxical that you're an investor. It, it does. So I've written an article probably a few years back where I talked about it. You know that owner occupied pre- uh, appeal property. So is it like Say that again? Come on. Owner occupied <laughs> appeal property. Damn, you got it. Uh, right. <laughs> is a bit like mainstream music, top forty music. Oh. And here's why, because you know how we have sort of the top forty charts. The top forty charts is what most people are saying that they do want to get into in terms of that they're listening. They like it. They absolutely like it. So it's a bit like, you know, but sometimes if you tune into a certain radio station and there's a lot of alternative music, some you're going to like, some you're going to not like. So for me, owner occupier appeal is a bit like top 40 music in the sense that I want to try and get the mainstream appeal. So that's what we thought to do. We'd just riff it in terms of talking about how we go from top down into and what we're, we're going to even walk through the property today, Bryce. We are going to walk through the property today, but just to show that this this episode is unrehearsed, it's live. Yes. There's no editing. Yes. We're going to pretend 
that this is the beginning and the top of the show where I go through the Mindset Minute. Of course, <laughs> the Mindset Minute. Let's go back to the Mindset Minute. I figured our, our community is full of Mindset Minutes. <laughs> and they don't need it. But today, mine's very simple. Very, very simple. Do you know what happened then, Ben? Bryce you, you had to come around, around, did you? No, you and I were chatting around. Ivis walked around you. She comes <laughs> over here. And then she's got a um, she's got a Surface Pro, yeah. so she's trying she's to put her fingers down my screen because I've got a Mac. And then she realizes and she points at that and she goes, "So just so you know, folks, oh, we, we are, are nothing. We are nothing but professional and uh, and polished. And where would we be without Ivis? Oh, don't yeah, don't sure. tell her. Yeah, tell okay. her secret. Um, mindset minute, bro. <laughs> tell me about your mindset minute. Very simple one, Ben. Very simple one. Um, you know, I love a good Jim Rohn and a good Zig Ziglar. In yes. fact, they're probably two of the icons for mindset minute for me. Uh, so never wish life were easier, Ben. Wish that you were better. Oh, well, I really like that one. And don't wish for, a, this is a, an extension of that. I can't yep. remember who said this, but I picked it up the other day. Don't wish for a lighter load, wish for a stronger back. Mm. Mm. Bit of resilience. Ponder those. Mm. So um, I, I think that's terrific because- uh, Tenacity. We're speaking right to the heart of the people who listen to our podcast, Ben, because yep. some, some of them are in the zone right now of buying an investment property and we're really topical and some mm. of them just have a portfolio and they just want to stay yep. sharp. Yep. But ultimately, I think what's consistent with all of our listeners is they may know some of this stuff. We we do talk some of the principles mm. that layer upon layer upon layer and they yep. get repeated, but they're just looking for that one little extra snippet that goes, right, that's just ratcheted up and I've just, I just got a little bit sharper. Yep. So never wish life were easier, wish that you were better. And I think that's uh, that's synonymous of our, our listener base. Yeah, they want to get better. So and hopefully we, we can iron sharpens iron, doesn't it, Bryce? Oh, look at you. Hey, hey. See, if you say it to me enough times, I actually it sinks into this thick brain of mine. Mate, mindset Minutes over to you. What's, what's one of your favourite Mindset Minutes? Oh, Success Leaves Clues. I like Ooh, that. I like that one. Yeah, I think that one's a really good one yeah. in terms of... And, you know, I'm just a believer in there's no such thing as a free lunch. You've got to do the work. You've got to, mm. you, you know, the 10,000 hours principle. You, mm. If you want to be a subject matter yeah. expert... Do you know, know that Tim Ferriss um, um, doesn't believe in the 10,000 hour principle? Ma- Malcolm Gladwell wrote the book, yes. um, 10,000 Hours, and I think the majority of people would agree. Because of his minimum effective dose, yeah, 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 I get it. He wants to uh, fast track it. He wants ten thousand to go down to the yeah. top three hundred hours that you need to know. Yep. Yeah. Um, hence, that's why I'm going so well with my guitar stuff because oh. I'm following his lead. <laughs> 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 Actually, in theory, it's really good. So, um, so there we go. So, uh, yes, love it. Owner occupier appeal, Ben. So let's start with owner. So let's start big. Let's start talking about, you know, when we're talking about cities. We're, we're making assumptions on cities, so we're talking about, you know, Melbourne, most livable city in the world. You know, you, you want to have all of those, you know, all of the bells and whistles, employment. In my view, obviously, you've got to be a knowledge city because that's where most of the future is going to lead. So that's going to give you some comfort around the knowledge city. So I, I wanted to start with city in terms of infrastructure, all the big things. Now, the big cities do have most of that. So that's the tick mm. that we start with at the top. Where do we go to from there, mate? For me, once I get to the suburb, it's you know the three frameworks, all the three pillars we always talk about, economic activity, human interest, human behavior. Yep. So if I overlay them, owner-occupy appeal for the suburb is where I am largely gonna minimize the commute that I have to get to my employment center. That's gonna yep. be a huge one for me. Yep. And then the human uh, interest is, you know, what do I do with my weekends? Have I got a nice park to walk my kids to? Is there a public tennis court? Is there some nice cafes? Can I get to the train station easily? Do I feel like I do? I feel safe mm. as I'm walking down the yep. streets? Are there other like likes? Are there people like me around me? Is that mm. sense of community? Um, and then, of course, to a certain extent, let's be honest. You know, the the human behaviour that yep. comes from what do people think of me? living in the suburb, yep. whether you believe or not that's a, the, the truth, that people are often um, judge where they uh, live based on people driving up their driveway and going, wow, yeah. you live Look, here. There's, there's status in that. I mean, and status and brand of a suburb can be affected by crime rates. Mm. It can be affected by those types of things, you know. I don't feel safe in this area. Mm. I don't feel, it doesn't feel familiar to me, whether it be the different ethnicities, whatever it may be, it's different things for different people. And we are generalising in that comment. But effectively, status is is born over time and brand is born over time. So, you know, if we mention areas like Mossman, Double Bay, Neutral Bay, if we mention areas like Toorak, you know, Brighton, uh, South Yarra. Belimba, Hamilton, South Perth. Correct, mm. yeah. All of those things 
um, they've, they've built their brand up and now that's very hard for that brand to be damaged. Um, in terms of areas that are gentrifying, that's taking place. And then there's the other areas which are going to take you know, an incredible amount of time for those areas to get that type of confidence that they are in safe environments. And that, that's all product of the demographic inside that area. So yeah, so we, we've, we've done it down to the suburb. Now, how do, you, how do you check that out? I mean, you know, we wanna give you practical ways in which to do that. Jump onto Google Earth. Jump onto Google Earth and basically tick on the the, the rail lines, tick on the, the roads, tick on the um, amenity, and all of these things will just start popping up. And you'll basically see all of these things from medical centres to schools to all of these wonderful things. That is the great way. And you just fly over them. If you want to sort of get a sense, if you're not familiar with them, because obviously from a borderless investor point of view, if you're going to be looking into state, uh, then it's important to be able to look at that. So the way in which I look at it, that's effectively what I'm talking about in terms of coming into that. So we get that, we get the owner occupier appeal, we get the human interest, human behaviour, the economic story of that area, and all of a sudden we're now into the suburb. Take me, take me into the suburb, Ross. What are we then doing? Well, then the other thing is I've got to go down a street. Yep. And I've got to find out where in the suburb I want to be. So A streets, B streets, C streets. But for me, I want to know the invisible line, Ben. Mm. I want to know where, where's the invisible line in the suburb where I cross over and it's a little bit higher, where I don't cross over and it's a little bit lower. And I think that's only something that you can get from having a familiarity with the suburb, mm-hmm. talking to the locals, being experienced. But clearly, you know, the premium prices are paid in the A streets, usually parked up on the, the you know. Yes. I remember when we were driving through Flemington, remember recently you go, oh, and you remember you were showing me the back street from mm. your place to get to the office. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And as we go down the hill, you go, right, now we're going towards the workers' cottages as we go down the hill. And as we're at the top of the hill, those, those grand mansions that were there. Um, so it's important to understand where those A streets are, the B streets are, and the C streets are. And obviously gravitate towards the A and the B. But for me, it's those invisible lines. What does that mean? Where are the cut-throughs where people are trying to get through to school? Where is it? Where are the people who are... Uh, there's a suburb in Melbourne which is actually um, quite good um, within 10 kilometres, but it's got a very large housing commission estate in it. And we want to know where they walk, which streets they walk through to get to the train station because that actually does have an impact. So those invisible lines I'm looking for. Yeah, so the, the other thing you can also do in terms of those visible lines is you can ask some of the real estate agents in that area. How many how many suburbs have you talked have you when you when you speak to as many real estate agents as we do, the golden triangle. Mm. I mean, there is so many suburbs that people talk about a golden triangle. And what they're basically saying is the ABC, you know, in terms of the, the areas inside that suburb that are great streets. And that's what they potentially call it. So they, they give some marketing ploy to it or is that, you know, the, oh, that's the high rise strip or that's the, the blah, blah, blah. So what you're trying to do is, is you know, you can get a quick uh, assessment of that by talking to a local estate agent to talk about, hey, do you have any golden triangle? I mean, where's your best streets in this area? Is there a, is there a, a congregation of them? Now, what's fascinating then though, Bryce, is when you actually go into those streets, there's something you see you know, I talked before about mainstream appeal, but you know, when I'm turning in to a, a great street, what what do I see? What are the first things that jump out at me in my mind? Right, the canopy of the trees, yes. the, the the width, width. of the, the road. Yeah. Are there Audis parked in there, or are there you know the Datsun 180B? Yeah. You know, that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, and it's and as you you know you just get a sense of what a beautiful street, and you can see how you know how wonderful it would live there in the hot summer days. You'd have a bit of tree foliage and all those types of things. They they really do speak volumes about manicured gardens, well kept, not too busy, um, accessible parking if you don't have off street parking, mm. a bit of that sort of on street parking if you need it. So. That, that tells the story, you know, nature strips mm. that are maintained and, and potentially front gardens. Now we're sort of starting to mm. turn our view and have a look at the stock on the street. So have a look at each of those properties. And, and coming back to that sort of the top 40 analogy that I used before, if, you know, if I put 100 people on a bus and we're driving down a street and I say to everyone, all right, I want you to both look out both sides of the windows Right? And I want you to, 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 to jump out at me when you see an ugly property. Mm. You know, and they're, they're, we're driving along. And then all of a sudden, yep, you know, everyone's yep, 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 yep. And it's like, okay, so you turn at it and it just looks out of place in the street. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that alternative song mm. that some people are going to like, but the majority aren't. Now, how do we correlate that to demand when we're buying that property? Well, if that property comes up for sale, 
because it, it might be so unique, there's a lot of people who just go, no, it's mm. ugly. Mm-hmm. I don't like it. Mm. So all of a sudden, the resale pressure on that, whereas the street itself could be phenomenal, that particular property may underperform the street because it doesn't have that first impression owner occupier appeal. So that's the way in which I like to explain it when I'm sitting down and talking to clients. Um, that is, you know, once you get that. So I always say, have you got an owner occupier appeal eye? Have you got a good eye for property? Because the people who have alternative views of that boxes look attractive and that those boxes won't date, um, ultimately aren't necessarily going to be a, a good person to go out and buy the right type of property. And what's important to think of a uh, context too, Ben, is um, uh, owner occupiers buy with their heart, not their calculator. Oh. And so what I want to do is I've been to that many auctions where I, I'll comp it up and there's a reasonable price expectation that I'll make and I'll put a little buffer on that just because, you know, it's a great property. But then sometimes, you know, and I, I employ a professional intimidation tactic and that's largely because I'm comfortable speaking in front of a group. But every now and then, no matter what I do, someone's going to come and they're going to shoot the lights out, outbid me. And essentially what they're doing is they're, they're throwing logic out the window because mm-hmm. logically they shouldn't pay that price, but they do. Their heart is fully invested in it. It's the school around the corner. It's a sister lives across the road. They grew up in the area. There's a great sort of cafe culture nearby, whatever it is. They've just said, I don't care, I've got to have it. Mm. Um, we've done it with a car, we've done it with a pair of jeans, mm. we've done it with an iPod, whatever it is. But that's the, the fundamental underlying principle of why we're chasing an owner-occupier appeal. Because if you're buying a property that's next to another property or within a kilometre radius of another property that someone just throws their heart at it, and then you send the most important person in the entire equation out to value your property, and then they go and use that as a comp, it helps lift the values of the mm. property. So that's the underlying principle versus the investor appeal stuff where... The investor just does a calculation. Whatever pops up on that screen is ultimately what they'll make a decision on. No emotion, walk away. Hmm. They don't let logic throughout the window. And, and they'll get the drag up value of everything going on. And we both have it. I mean, I know you've told me a couple of stories where you're, you know, you've been engaged, I've been engaged by a buyer and they've just said, whatever it takes. Mm-hmm. Like, no cap, no. No mm-hmm. cap. So get out there and buy the property. So obviously our job is to in, intimidate and some, you know, show that we've got the deepest pockets in the world. And and ultimately we've been successful in buying those properties. But that's you know that's that's the rarity because that's usually we're buying for an owner occupier as opposed to an investor in that case because it's maybe against our better judgment to be paying that sort of price. But they don't care. They just want that asset. So we're in the street. We've now got a sense of the streetscape. Let's turn and look at the property price. Ooh. And what are we what are we looking for in when we when we see that 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 dream property? For me, it's the street presence on on the street. So mm. flat streets are easy, but what if you're not on a flat street? Are you on the high side? Are you on the low side? Because just by n- nature, people prefer to be on the high side rather than the low side. And then for for a whole range of reasons. So for me, uh, that's the first thing. What is the geography? What's the what's the undulation of the mm. land? Because that's where I want to be. All things being equal, it's all about the street presence and which yep. side. Yep. So um, for me, I, I like you know pick a fence or some type of fence, and I don't like a busy garden. Mm. I don't like you know someone who's pottering in this fifty thousand pot plants or anything like that. I want normally I want a central walkway up to the veranda. Um, so it's a perfect world. And even if I'm looking at, say, a, a single fronted uh, semi, and I still would love a little bit of veranda, a little bit of, of lawn at the front. You know, some of them in Collingwood and North Detroit, they're just, you know, basically the, the, the fence is it's effectively one step and you're on the veranda. So mm. that doesn't have, because you feel pressured like you're on the street, don't you? You feel like the front door is effectively straight on the street and then you, they're usually maybe busier streets. So I don't get that sense of depth that I can sit on my front veranda grab a good book, you know, soak up the afternoon sun. That's not what I'm getting with those types of properties. So when I'm walking up the property, I like clean garden lines. I also like a little night light. So the, the, the night lighting or a bit of a strip lighting around that so to light up the trees at night, that's gonna give me a sense of warmth and, and caring in that particular property. So that's the, the perfect. And then I come up to the veranda and I'm, and I'm also, you know, taking a step back and having a look at the style of the property mm. and saying, is it boxy? Is it nice? Is it exactly what people are looking for? For me, it's the uh, the context of the property within the street. So what does this property look like in context for every other property? So by that, is every other property in the in the street a weatherboard and this one's a brick mm. or vice versa? Or does everyone else in the street 
actually have parking off street mm. and this is the only one with it on street or vice versa. I'm, I'm wanting to build that context mm. as to how this actually fits because if you think about as we as humans, we want to be, we want to mirror, we want to be same, same, we want to be like, like yep. and so we don't want to stand out for the wrong reasons mm. but sometimes it might mean that's how you get into yeah. the suburb but if we're talking, Correct. this podcast yeah, this is, is, this is, is the a perfect. textbook, <laughs> we're building a textbook here so that yeah, then, yeah. and there's always um, fluctuations but if we overlay is. that textbook then at least people can get a bit of a sense of that. So yep. for me, I want to know the context of this street compared to every other street. I want to know the context of this house compared to every other house in the street, just to give me that sense of, mm. of that emotional investment that people have in the property. And if I've got a bit of elevation there, so the veranda's set up a little bit high so I can see maybe over the front fence, so you know, high side, low side of the street is really is really good one. So it just gives me a sense of if, I, if I'm actually going to spend some time on the veranda having a G&T as the sunset, I've got some type of aspect. And again, that depth of that aspect is really powerful in different streets. Gin and tonic, Ben. Look at you. <laughs> hey, before we're about to step, I know you've just built it beautifully as we step up to the front door. Yep. But what I want everyone to do is just turn around and face the other side of the street. Yep. And I want to know that there's another front door that I can see rather than a back fence. Yes. Because that's yep. going to really affect what that streetscape looks like. So that quite often happens. If you've got a, a main road um, going through um, a suburb, and there's a little lane behind mm. the main road. Yep. yep. You end up often seeing the um, you know the backside of those houses. Often you know that's a C grade street, isn't it? Yeah. It totally. is. So so yep. that's that's what we want to make sure that as we turn around, and we look at our neighbours. We want to make sure we can see their front door because mm. that gives us that sense of security, that sense of um, uh, you know we've got to remember our friends are going to roll up on a Saturday night for a dinner party and you want them to. There was an episode. Um, uh, I did on the show, Location, Location, Location Australia, and there was yep. a guy, and he goes, Bryce, I just want to go up the driveway and sort of say, I can't believe that I live there. Mm. you know. And he wants his friends to say, I can't believe that you live there. Well, if they're turning around looking at another mm. neighbour, there's you've got a better chance of them saying that rather than they turn up and it looks like it's a, yes. you know, a bit of graffiti. Like, Mate, I can't believe you live here. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's important. True. Okay. So, I mean, obviously with some of the more modern homes that we're building now, the driveway, the garage, the two-door garage is going in and there's usually a side entrance like a service entrance into the house. But in terms of that, that grander entrance and that walking up that driveway uh, and that uh, veranda, the footpath going to the veranda, a centralised approach to that gives a little bit more sense of opulence and grandeur. And that's where you'll get a little bit more bang for buck in terms of that, oh, look at the people walking as they come through the entry gate. They're coming in and they're seeing the garden all well done and thinking, wow, this is, you know, this is a home that's full of love and, and you know, appreciation for the building of the garden and what they're doing with it. Look at you, mate, showing your, uh, your, your feeling side. So as we walk through, um, then we're going to overlay, what, what I do is overlay the textbook floor plan. Yeah. So if you can just, I know this is hard to visualize on a podcast, but if you, if you think of a rectangle that's built into four sort of equal sections, mm. the front section of that rectangle is the sleeping zone. Um, the, the next section is the services. The next section is living and then the final section is entertainment. And if you think that through, you walk through that front um, section, there's the bedrooms. Then you walk through to it and you've got your laundry and your bathroom. Then you walk through to the, the kitchen and the living and the dining. And that's where you do most of your living. And then you walk out the back and you have your entertaining. Mm. That is textbook yes. floor plan. And, totally um, textbook. And perfect textbook. But it is perfect textbook because it's also accommodating the fact that you're on a quiet street. Mm. So that's why. Because if you know people might say, well, if I'm on a busy street, will I put my bedrooms in the front? Of course not. Mm. You know, you'll obviously put some of the sitting rooms or something like that or the dining room or you know the kids' room at the front and then work back from that. But the reality is we're talking about textbook. Uh, well, problems. if you think about it too, Ben, if you know, oh, we've got young kids, if yes. we've got them asleep at the front, we can still actually live at night at the back. Yes. And then you've, and then, um, and also the, you know, you walk through some of these older um, properties and then quite often even a single fronted, you'll, you'll have a, a, a bathroom right at the back of the floor plan. Yeah. So if they think that through, you know, you've got someone over on a Saturday night, your teenage daughter actually is having a shower and she has to come out and walk to her bedroom. Yeah. That's just awkward. That's yep. not yep. not preferable, all no. that sort of stuff to walk past your guests. So that's why you think about this from a textbook standard. If the shower is next to the bedroom, you're straight in, your privacy is um, is maintained, and then of course the living out the back. So we open the doors. Mm -hmm. um, now, when I say doors, because it's interesting. I mean, obviously a, a wider hallway and a higher ceiling um, gives that initial internal wow factor. 
So it doesn't have to ha- doesn't have to be over the top on ornate ceiling work and all of that, but just that general sense of opening up those that front door to a wider hallway. Mm. Now, not every property is going to have that. So you know your hallway is your hallway, but if you do have a, a sense of space in that hallway, um, you know with a with a an arrival sort of what are those things called on the side there, Bryce? Where you put all your keys and your hang your hat racks and mate, all I'm, that. I'm uncultured as you are. Maybe you just <laughs> hook it ask Ivers for Yeah, it's something. It's a yeah. wrong thing. It's got a mirror. Make sure we're, we're all in order when we're walking the kids out. That's usually the way in which it goes. Um, yeah, you can see I'm not an interior designer. No, but um, so so yeah. You, so you you walk. You're right. You want yep. the high ceilings. You want the ornate features wherever you can because yep. people will place a premium on that. Period, yep. But as you walk through the bedrooms, Ben, for me, you know, I want I want the proportions to be three. Plus by three plus. That's mm. that's usually you know three point something meters by three point something meters. Yeah. I've bought plenty of properties under three, yeah. but we're talking about textbook owner occupier appeal as much yep. space as we can get. Yep. Um, is ideal. Built-ins, um, obviously the robes. We want doors on those usually to try and keep it clean and look nice. Um, obviously the higher ceilings give that sense of size and space for those rooms. And what's really important, even into the bedrooms, is natural light Mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about natural light as we walk right through that property because what we also don't necessarily want is a hallway that's struggling with natural light you know if we open up the front doors in summer we'll get that flow through of of air that's coming through but as we walk through that property we're looking for the size and space of those bedrooms uh, to be able to accommodate that and then that's pretty easy and we don't want too busy a bedroom um, sitting chairs and all that is is over the top. It's just enough space where there's an area for a desk, for study, um, and also the robe and, and obviously double beds in each room. So size matters for owner-occupier appeal, Ben. So if you can, with the master bedroom, you want an ensuite, but yes, uh, ideally 100%. you want two. Uh, you want the ensuite and you want a separate bathroom yeah. as we walk through. So talk to me about that separate bathroom because obviously inside an ensuite you usually don't get a bath. Usually it's, you know, in the smaller ones you're getting a shower, but in in the bigger, more opulent homes, you obviously get the freestanding bath. um, And in the main bathrooms, you're also potentially getting the double vanity. Mm -hmm. And in the en suite, you're getting the double vanity, but you certainly don't have the shower over the bath. Mm. You know, in in the main bathroom, you want to try and avoid that. You want to have enough space in that bathroom area where that, and obviously the biggest no-no for bathrooms is having the toilet in with the main bathroom. Now, I own one of those properties where the toilet is right next to the shower uh, and it's performed very well, but we are talking about textbook here in terms of looking at that because if we can separate the the toilet from the bathroom, um, even in the flats that you buy, that is a big difference because if you've got two, uh, you know, share flatmates um, and having the one bathroom and with the one toilet in that bathroom, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Separate water closet is ideal, Ben. Absolutely. So, so for me, a couple of things. Then um, you, you touched on it. Um, you want good natural light. Yep. For me, it's the the aspect as well. And so the obvious one is you go, what's the view of Bondi mm. Beach? No, I'm talking about when I look out of the kitchen. Am I looking into a wall, mm. or am I looking into the garden, or am I looking into something that's pleasant? Because I'm going to spend a lot of time there. So I I want to be scouring around looking for what aspects do I have in the main living areas because this is going to impact me. A fair bit. Mm. Um, so the better the aspect, textbooks or view of the ocean, but just dumb it down to mm. let's. What am I looking into something that's ugly, or am I looking to something that's pleasant? Because I'm going to spend a bit of time doing it. Yeah, because what what we have noticed over the generations is there has absolutely been a real change as we move out into the living zones where the kitchen used to be away. It used to be, you know, it used to hide to do the cooking and then bring the food out and present that into the living zone. These days, with all of our great cooking shows and, and food is now an artistry, it's, it's, it's part of our living. We absolutely want to break bread and, and create food in an open environment. So we might still have the, the side kitchen and that might limit potentially the views down the side because obviously we might have a neighbouring house. But if that's part of an open plan type forum where we've got the, the, the kitchen and dining or kitchen and living, that works. Mm. You know, that has been a big part of that, that new transition of what we've got. Well, I think that brings up a very good point for it. It's flow. You know, mm. we talked about textbook. If you don't have a textbook um, floor plan, what does the flow look like? It doesn't make sense that you have to go from your living area through your kitchen, through your laundry to get out the back mm. to hang out at summer. Because it makes sense you want to just go in Correct. and out, have that alfresco dining. So 
for me, the next step is to make sure that the flow of the floor plan makes sense. And if you think about some of, the, I know you've got a cow bung, but some of the some of the cow bungs, instead of being long and thin like they had in the, uh, mm. the Victorian um, era, they went sort of fatter. And quite often cow bungs had um, uh, a room in the middle that, where they just built ours. floor plans around Correct. where there's no natural lock. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, that was effective. I mean, our original cow bung was a two better with double doors into dining and it had a, a servery window mm. and the servery was next to the fireplace. And obviously, you know, the, the, the cooking was done in this dark and dingy, smoky room and it was served through the window. Ours is a 1927 Cal Bung and that's basically what happened. So we've obviously had to recalibrate that. Uh, we've knocked out that middle room and now that's a, a, a staircase and an open floor plan to come out to the back to the living zone or the social zone as we call it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, well, you're the definition of what we're talking about because in, in terms of, um, you know, you're going through a, a building progress, process now, but yep. uh, you did have the old lean-to um, kitchen, yep. didn't you? Classic separate, lean-to, yeah. you know. Um, Jane has had to put up with that for many, many years, so we're only getting over that now, which is really exciting. But that's the classic case of, yep, you know, in the 50s and 60s, we just did these lean-tos. You know, so that the reality is, is that's obviously a challenge for that. So as we're working through those zones, you know, we've gone from the bedroom zones into the bathroom zones and the, and the wet zones. Mm. And now we're coming out into the living and lifestyle zones. Yeah, yeah. So again, for me, there's one thing you can't get too much of as an owner occupier. And I think, I reckon I could get 100% guarantee everyone agrees with this. Maybe someone will say no, but uh, <laughs> yeah. um, what's well, the main trip? You're looking for the top forty. Just remember, top storage. 40. You cannot yeah. have enough storage. Mm. So that's something that we're looking for with owner occupier appeal because people got to store this stuff. There's no yeah. Dropbox for stuff, is there, Ben? You've got to put it somewhere. <laughs> you can't put it in all in Evernote, can you, mate? <laughs> oh, actually, there's a good point. <laughs> no, take you, all of those photos and just put it in Evernote. Uh, you, you, yeah, you storage can, is critical. Critical. And so looking for opportunities to be smart with storage, yep. you know, a, a, a great one I've seen is where they lift the stairs up, boom, and then you put your shoes in the stairs and then yep. drop each stair down as a, as a good little storage spot. But um, clearly that's something we need to look for. Yeah, so, so I'm sort of in that sort of uh, living zone. I'm coming through. So I've got maybe an island bench in the kitchen area. I think that that sort of just does make that natural separation, but keeps it light and open. I've seen some houses where they make the island bench the big cooking area and they bring down the the, um, the uh, exhaust systems. I think that breaks the flow up a bit. I'd much prefer to see that sort of on the wall area. Mm. But because I want that openness, I want to be able to call out to the kids or call them in to wash their hands for dinner or that type of thing. So that's really important. Do you want a little interesting fact for you? If you have a really great house with a um, an island with a cook, st- a cook uh, cooktop on it and no exhaust above it, you've got a very high chance of um, a television show uh, renting your house for the day to do a cooking show. Of course. Because yeah. that's what they're looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they, they want to be able to get all different they angles. get all the angles, and it's not yeah. very often that they find it. So when yeah. they find a good one... So oh, I, I know of someone who's got one, so there you go. I'll, I'll have to send pass on their details. But, I, but I, a little caveat, we've actually uh, had our uh, TV crew through and, mate, what we do to their house is, oh, well, I, don't th- <laughs> I don't think there's enough money to, like, we wear, like, there's a cast of thousands in their house. I don't know that it's worth a thousand of, uh, bucks a wear day and tear for a few days. Yeah. So, so I, you know, in terms of my perfect floor plan is then having the living zone, so where, where the, maybe the nightly news is being played and, and where a bit of that sort of uh, lounge um, main activity of the house is, as we talk about our day and, and maybe have a glass of red or something along those lines, and we're talking to the kids about their day, that, that to me is all in that area. And then I've got a little side area off the side where there's the dining. So, you know, we go to the dining table for catching up and all of that. But the main living zone is is really, that's, that's ground zero for lots of activity mm. in terms of that. So I've got other more sort of formal sitting areas and those type, but that's the, that's the, the you know, ground zero for that type of thing. So... We've got that right, and then where do we go from there? Mate, we step out the back, oh. and then we've got to see where the sun is, mate. So it's all yeah. about orientation. It is. What's the orientation of the block? So if we live below the equator, we want to be north-facing. Yes. We live north of the equator, we want to be south-facing. Um, people often ask what that's all about. Mm. Well, you want the living areas to be facing north, ideally. Mm. And it's, it's very simple. 
in the winter sun, it's lower, yep. and you want it pumping Comes over in. from the east and settles in the west. Yep. But instead of going right over the top, Correct. it's got that little sort of 45 degree arc, which means it's shooting all that natural light in, shooting all that warmth in, mm. um, to wherever you can get the north. And it's interesting, um, where, where first time, I've seen it loads, where you get first time um, home buyers who effectively go to the house supermarket. They go and pick a block off, you know, they put a dot on the block and then yeah. they go and pick a plan and they orient it and then they build it and they go, oh my goodness, oh, I've totally forgotten to think about the orientation, the orientation. of the sun. So yeah. Yeah. that's important. Oh, it is. I mean, you know, our coal bungalow actually faces west. Mm. So we get, you know, the sun coming in the side, but in, in obviously the, the heat of the day. Now, we're, we're opposite a park. Mm. So we, we've obviously, you know, said the park aspect and the city views at the back outweighed the you know the, the orientation that we were looking for but that's an example but absolutely the perfect nothing, uh, nothing wrong with your place mate trust me <laughs> you listen, listeners well, trust me no no it's, it's, it, right now there's a lot wrong with it there's a lot of dirt and bricks and dust and crap everywhere it's, it's just a building site but see the, that see that violin ives <laughs> <laughs> the but it's it's, it's important to know because obviously the other big transition that's been happening is when we go out the back one little door to take us out to a deck, yep. you know, because that laundry's there or whatever, that's not a good floor plan. Obviously the double doors, you know, the big bay doors that open up and let that indoor to outdoor area take shape makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the, the final thing I can think of in terms of um, what we look for owner, owner occupier appeals, we've gone at the back, we've got the northerly sun on our mm -hmm. face, is then just privacy. Do our neighbours look into us yep. or do we have that sense of looking around, yep. I can be out the back sort of with the kids in the pool, um, reading whatever I read and I don't have 50 sets of eyes on me that I don't know about, you know, that fishbowl. So mm -hmm. perfect is there's enough uh, space in the backyard that you can't see your neighbours at all. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I bring it back to the big thing for me, I sort of try to summarise the house into what are owner occupiers, are they going to be house proud? And, and for me, if they've done all of the ticks in the box of an entertainer's home, you know, then, you know, you were talking before about if I brought a friend here and like, oh, I can't believe what a wonderful home they've got. If you've got that entertainer element, which is you've got the areas for the kids because the best floor plan also potentially has two zones, mm -hmm. so two living zones. Mm -hmm. So you can separate the kids from the adults so they can go and watch a movie and you guys can have some adult time. That is really, really important into the right type of floor plan. And they, so where some people make mistakes is they have the lounge, living, dining all in the one L shape or corner area. That is problematic if you don't have a second story where you have a loft or a landing where there's enough area where you can put three or four kids to watch a movie or something like that. So it's really, really important for me to try and see two living zones in a perfect world. Um, that's the sort of thing that then allows me to tick the box. I've got the spare bedroom being the fourth bedroom potentially. So, you know, if they if they come back to that entertainment piece, that's that status. Mm. You know, and we all like to entertain. I um, mean, I can feel like I can have dinner parties there and that type of thing and, and create memories. Then all of a sudden I'm emotionally attached to that property. Yeah, no, I agree, Ben. So uh, the final thing is just decor. And I think that's, uh, mm. that's a, there's no... Uh, other than to say, I think, you know, neutral light colours are often universal appeal yep. to everyone, but people are going to have specifics about what sort of um, features they like, what sort of textures they like, what sort of colours. But ultimately, um, the owner-occupier appeal, in my view, is best served by um, uh, having colour schemes that allow for light to, to yep. fill the room rather than to yep. feel like it's all heavy and yeah. Bring that natural light in. And, and if you've got certain uh, tastes where you've got... Uh, canary yellow walls or something like that that's not in all peach one of the favorites of the mm. 80s you see some of this legacy properties you're walking through and, and that peach and what, what was what, it when what, they when they do the wash the, the peach what oh my oh I'd, like I, I, for some reason one of my properties i had a um i lived in it when i first lived on the gold coast yeah. and i did that sponge yeah, wash that's <laughs> I thought it was so, I was just talking I thought about it was so good. Sponge, look, I'm not. Recently, I just painted good. it back to neutral. So I thought, what was I drinking? I mean, thinking. So, yep. yeah. So, so there it is. You know, uh, simple colour palettes with 
with nice, you know, and if you've got the fireplaces and a few other those sort of wow factors that come through that, you really do have a property that is highly desirable. Now, you might be thinking, yeah, at a price tag of $2 million or $3 million, but the reality is, is that you can, even in, you know, sort of semis and so forth, you can still create those zones. You can still potentially allow yourself the ability to have a house that flows. Mm. And, you know, and you can still potentially, even though you might have a tight space, try to get that entertainment piece together. Now, in a city, it's not going to happen. You're going to go out to entertain. Mm. That's the way it is. Mm. You might have a balcony where you might have a pre-dinner drink, but ultimately, you know, you still want to effectively have that sense of separation in the different zones um, subtly and, you know, nice clean lines and natural light. Yeah, yeah, well said. I think I think the point was we just had a little bit of farm. We were able to just yeah. visually take our listeners on a journey and what's the textbook. But ultimately, what we did is provide a framework. We started out wide and we mm. came into a very uh, finite thing. But you can, over, Ben, if I'm looking at a two-bedroom apartment or a flat, um, I can think about in terms of is there enough storage? Has it got good natural light? Does the floor plan make sense? Is the separate toilet? Mm. Have I got separate um, living zones to my sleeping zones? So the, the principles, you know, sure, mm. everyone wants to live in a $3 million house in Hawthorne or Mossman that's but ultimately what we've done is just said well these are the things take the bits that apply to you get context within the suburb get context within the street and overlay these principles and that'll help you determine am I buying an asset that has owner occupier appeal because I'm an investor or have I bought an asset that doesn't have owner occupier appeal and ultimately the ones that do have owner occupier appeal cater to the 70 percent cater to the larger part of the market cater to the part of the market that let emotion drive their decisions because let's remember that people who buy a house don't go into exorbitant um, research to they does it feel good they're going to have to compromise on some things because but you know what I mean? Like they don't go through, they they don't go through no. reports and stats and no. they go, does it feel right? Are my kids going to go to a good yeah. school? And what do my friends think about it? So yeah. Yeah. if we think about it from that paradigm, we're going to be better investors, Ben. We are. And, and, and if having, you've been nodding your head whilst you've been going, you know, what well, is this like, oh, that makes, uh, that, that, yeah, I do that. Then ultimately you've got a pretty good eye. Mm. So it's just a matter of putting that to work. Mm. Yeah, no, well done. So, um, so it kind of segues into um, a couple of things. I, uh, you know, our ultimate goal on this podcast, Ben, is people use it to make better decisions. Correct. You know, hark back to episode one. Don't make a dumb decision. So hopefully, and we're, we're, we're getting some traction because uh, on iTunes, we get some uh, some good reviews, Ben. So this one's from Stakes86. I was just about to sign a house and land package about a month ago when I found your podcast. After listening to your awesome free info, I did some more digging and realized that I was going to be paying about $30,000 over price. Mm. Thanks. This is from Samantha. Hi guys, I'm 24 and embarrassed to say that I've only just discovered this amazing new thing, the podcast. I'm now obsessed with your channel, in brackets, are they channels? And I'm going through every single episode. I own a PPOR, but after being diagnosed with a brain tumor, Mm. I'm just now back on track saving a deposit for my first investment. I wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time to create relatable, relevant, easy to follow content. Your podcast is so valuable to me and I look forward to my commute to work every day to see what else I will learn. Thanks again, wishing you health, happiness, wealth, and freedom. So obviously we're cutting through, Ben, and getting our, our, our topics are relatable. And uh, on your lads for passing on some, gem, some gems. Here's to my fourth property purchase, and that was from Liam. Oh, very nice. And good luck to that person who's given us yeah, some, having some nice. health challenges. Yeah. yeah, 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 obviously, you know, good health to you. So look, that's why we do it. We love it. We love doing it. It's always fun um, if we're, you know, if you've got a couple of takeaways from today's episode, we've done uh, we've done our job, and that's effectively what we want. And if we missed anything, folks, uh, at The Property Couch, at Ben Kingsley AU, at Bryce Holdaway, let us know on social media, and we'll make sure that uh, uh, that it's fully covered, Ben, if there's something that we missed in that little exercise. So. Totally. And, and Bryce, you know that last week we did say we were going to have Jeremy Shepard on, mm. but we didn't. Mm. So so he's it, coming up. He is so coming up. It, it, like we're in we're in beta testing yeah we're in beta testing of location score so if you haven't already registered last chance to let us know last chance to let us know that we are just checking it out making sure that it's, it's but he's work. coming he's, yes he's, he's definitely coming so that won't be long hey life hack ben um, yes i want to read out to um Bedden, who's one of our clients a very loyal client um uh, hey Bryce, hope you're having a nice weekend with your family i hope this email uh finds you well but i couldn't stop myself uh, saying another thank you for telling us about Blinkist. Remember my life hack? Yes, Blinkist. good, love it. Another one I'm not on commission, just so everyone knows. <laughs> I just got off the flight uh, from the Gold Coast, during which I finished 10 
book summaries. Whoa. Ten. Ten. Where did he fly from? The Gold Melbourne? Coast Ooh. to Melbourne. So that's uh, in two hours is read, read, read ten summaries. Of book summary. Now, it's not a substitution for reading the book, Ben, but what it means is you can cover more content, and if you like something, then you can delve and go and get the book and read the whole thing. My reading life is literally divided into the following four stages. One, pre-school. Two, pre-audiobooks. Three, post-audiobooks, but pre-Blinkist. And four, post-Blinkist. I definitely owe this fourth stage to you, um, and similar to the fact that I owe you and Ben the financial security of my family. So thank you, Ben, for that. And we also got another person sent us in a life hack, Ben. Yep. And it's terrific. We're going to put it up on our Facebook. It was from John Fryk, F-R-Y-C. I think that's, oh, if I, yep. uh, forgive me if I, he goes, here's an amazing life hack. And this plays right into the money smarts. And I wish we I had a, We love this I one. I wish I had an own this fun. Um, and it's got a photo of Mr. Bean, right? Yeah. Who's let's, it? Who's let's build it up. Is it Mr. Bean? Mr. Bean lying lying on a bed with a, Alan Atkins, a, a Mr. Genius. Looks like a Mr. T from the A Team um, quilt <laughs> with a model plane and a, a clock in the background. Maybe a reasonably inappropriate portrait, but um, <laughs> at, at the back, you need check to, it out. You need to go and check yeah. this out. Yeah. But here's the hack, folks. I know you're hanging on the edge of your seat for this. Um, if you sleep till lunchtime, then you can save on your breakfast money. <laughs> there Boom. it is. Guy's a genius. Mate, that's how you... Uh, yeah, you might lose your job <laughs> if you keep doing it. But, but you've thought. saved on your breakfast money, so oh, you don't need your job as much. Love it. <laughs> There's that smashed avocado. No, no longer needed. No longer needed. So, um, save that deposit. Oh, oh there we go. Yeah, There's yeah. a little link. Um, did you know? Did you know, Bryce? So, not Frank. Global House Index, yeah. quarter one, 2017. So we're talking about the change, the 12-month change in property prices globally, um, as measured by uh, Frank, sorry, Knight Frank, I should say, Frank Knight, Knight Frank. Why do people have two names? Anyway, that's another story. Right here, what's number one? What do you think is number one? So the biggest change in 12 months, growth. Everyone's talking about Australia being booming property market. How do you think we fared? Well, this this is embarrassing for me, Ben, because um, I didn't actually hear the beginning of what you said because I was thinking about something else. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, well, that, that tunes out. That, that, so it's the it's the growth of property over the last twelve months globally for the different countries. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so number one, yeah. Do you have a, a clue? Tell so me. I'll give you an idea. <laughs> All right. So twelve month change was seventeen point eight percent. Okay, which country was it that grew? They're, they're in 12 months from quarter one 2016 to quarter one 2017, 12 month growth. The country was Russia. Boom boom. The country was. <laughs> yeah, I'm just being a smart <laughs> yeah. now. Iceland. No. Iceland's property prices grew by 17.8 percent for the year. Is is it igloo structure? I mean, which value is it going out <laughs> and valuing igloo? Seriously, I think, you know, Iceland a bit the of price of ice through the GFC, so maybe okay. it's just recovering. Number two, two. Number two was Kazakhstan. 14.4 percent growth. You know, I'm not going to get the answers, so that's why <laughs> you're setting me up here. Yeah. New Zealand, Hong Kong. Oh, that would have been Hong Kong. Yeah. Number three, Shanghai. Number three with 13.8%, New Zealand. Oh, Our friends was... across the ditch. Damn. Yeah, they all both got that. Damn. All right, Canada's number four at 13.5, Malta. Malta came in oh, at 6, 12.6. <laughs> Czech Republic at 7 and 11% growth. Estonia came in at number eight at 10.7. Number nine was Hungary at 10.5. Number 10 was China at 10.3. Mate, we're not even in the top 10. Mate, can you imagine the headlines in those newspapers? We're not no, even in the top housing 10. Housing affordability is an issue. It's, we're in a crisis. Let, let, Who can afford this? Let's go further. Because oh, obviously these oh, are obviously more. country. There, there's oh, more. There's more. Wow, so I'll take a seat. It, Norway, Ireland, India, Colombia, Sweden, Bulgaria, Lithuania, Romania, Latvia, all before Australia. We come in at 20th. Okay, with an hour... Obviously, because some of our other cities aren't firing like Melbourne and Sydney have been. So we come in at 7.7%. Okay. So, just goes to show you, and I reckon inside, obviously, these other areas like New Zealand, Hong Kong, Turkey, Canada, there's some of those cities are going to be performing just as good as Sydney. Mm -hmm. All right? So just remember, 
that yep, we've had a good market here, but obviously property prices move in cycles in different locations. So did you know, Bryce, 20th, we are 20th in terms of growth of property values across the globe, night Frank? The answer is no, Ben. I did not know. Thank you. I no, did you not know. Do. I wonder how many listeners knew. There we go. There you go, folks. Owner Occupier Appeal. What the dickens is it? Well, hopefully we've unpacked that, Ben. I Provided so. some gold. Any other sort of... Yep. Bryce, remember, knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it. I like it. Till next week, folks. See you later. See you later.